All right, you guys, uh, let's get going. And I will, um, for the first few minutes, since people tend to come in a little bit late, I will make that announcement a couple times. So I apologize if I have to stop mid, mid sentence to say it quickly, but um, let's go ahead and get going. All right. <clears throat> So thank you all so much for coming. I'm very, very grateful to have you guys here. Um, for those of you who are just signing on, uh, please click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and choose a language. If you don't understand how to do that, click on the chat button. I've written it in English there and hopefully Alex has written it in Spanish there as well. Okay, so here we go. This is our this or that making delicious choices um, nutrition presentation. I'm very excited to talk with you guys about this. Um, there is a lot to cover in today's presentation, so I'm going to move at a fairly steady pace. So um, let's save the questions for the very end. So keep notes of anything that you want me to come back to um, when I'm finished. Um, for those of you who have not been at a, one of my presentations, I am Melanie Murphy Richter. I am the uh, registered dietitian for Head Start and Early Head Start um, for both programs. Uh, I do have my master's in the science of nutrition, health span, and longevity from USC. Um, and in my uh, role at Head Start and Early Head Start, I not only do nutrition consults for um, both parents and children, um, but I also help to uh, plan meals for our children in our Head Start program. So um, I'm I, anything related to nutrition, I do that. Um, for anybody just joining the presentation, please click on the chat button and read the instructions on how to choose your language. Otherwise, you will not hear this presentation. If you have questions, just raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Let's keep on going. So <clears throat> before we dive into this course, um, I do want to just call out, we have, I have a few uh, series, nutrition series presentations going on this year. This particular series is part of our Head Start program, um, nut Advanced Nutrition Education, and this is the first of its series. Um, we will also be doing a series on sugar in November, on November 16th. <clears throat> And we are doing a, another presentation on December 14th about um, just budgeting for how to stretch your meals in a healthy way. So these are this is a combination series based on advanced education in nutrition, um, teaching you how to be smarter consumers, smarter health-wise, smarter budget-wise, um, and just smarter in general. So let's dive into this particular presentation, which is about this or that, making healthy food choices. So why, why did I choose to do this presentation today? Um, there's a variety of reasons that I decided to do this presentation. The bulk of it is because of our, the very changing uh, history and future of our food system. We have, we used to, as humans, we used to farm and we used to plant our seeds and we used to harvest our food. And we were very in touch with the land and what was in season and what was happening with the earth. We are not anymore. And that's actually a really good thing in many ways because we don't have to spend our time gardening and farming and all of the things. Only a select few of us do that for the greater mass. Um, but be, the bad part about that is that we are very disconnected from our food supply. Most of us just go to the grocery store and pick up what we need and go home. We have no idea what's in season. We don't understand necessarily what to cook or how to cook our food or how it's grown. Um, and that's challenging when we are trying to eat health, healthier and we're trying to understand what's best for our bodies. So that's, that's position number one. Um, our food supply is very automated, meaning we, we don't, we're not involved in it. A, and also it's become a mass agriculture uh, production, meaning we, we, there, yes, there are farmers, but we rely a lot on big machinery, big farms, big um, uh, scalable uh, uh, agricultural practices in order to feed all of us at, at a global scale. So a lot of this means that we 
are doing things that aren't sustainable for the earth. Um, we're seeing this in overfishing. We're having a fishing, a fish issue in our, in our, on our planet right now. We have soil erosion. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, that means that we're not, because of mass agriculture, we're not taking care of the actual soil that our plants are growing in, which means that our soil doesn't have as many minerals and vitamins as it used to. So that means our food doesn't have as many minerals or vitamins as it used to. We have to eat a lot more of it, right? Than we used to. This is a really big problem at a mass scale if we continue down this route. Um, also, a lot of our farming practices and our agricultural practices are leading to climate issues. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to certain sections of the presentation. Um, so that's number two. That's another reason why I wanted to talk about this presentation. Also, marketing, food marketing, food labels um, can are incredibly misleading. It is so challenging to go to the grocery store and understand what is healthy. There's things like natural and organic and you know, whole foods and whole grain. And what does any of it mean? It's very hard, um, even for people like me who specialize in this industry to go to the grocery store and understand what I'm eating and what I'm buying. So that's another thing. Um, and also uh, going back to the manufacturing part, our bodies, because of the quick pace in which we have scaled our food system in the last 100 years, which seems like a long time, but it's actually not a long time at all for our, for our physical human experience. Our bodies haven't been able to adapt as quickly to this mass scale of production. So our bodies aren't able to process a lot of these new things that we've brought into our food supply to that have allowed food to be grown quicker and grown bigger and grown at scale. And our bodies haven't been able to process that as quickly as we've been able to produce it. Um, and that's actually leading to chronic diseases. So this is why we're talking about this particular presentation. I know that this is these are hefty topics, um, but I'm going to break it down for you, I promise. <laughs> OK, so uh, and I just want to call out that um, I know that I'll, whenever I start these presentations, it always seems like a huge doom and gloom situation. I promise it is not a doom and gloom situation. This presentation is intended and, and my work as a dietitian is intended to not only re-educate you, um, but also empower you as consumers to be able to decipher what you're reading at the supermarket, to be able to understand what your body needs at any given time of the year. Um, and also to understand and empower you and to um, ignite this, this spirit of, yes, you can be healthy while also being and eating delicious foods. And I think that there's a huge disconnect um, in our uh, food, in our marketing of food today that food has to be unhealthy to be delicious. And that's not necessarily true. So I wanted to debunk and a lot of my work is debunking this, this concept. Um, so the way that I've, I've designed today's presentation is I broke it down into the food groups. And part of that is to also just remind you about how we build a plate. Um, give me one second. I'm going to let my cat out really quickly. Hold on. Okay. She was going to meow this whole time if I didn't. Um, so if you guys have been to my presentations before, um, I've done several on my plate that what you're seeing on the right hand of the screen, this is called my plate. This is the USDA um, created uh, strategy for building a healthy meal. This is for adults and children. Um, and you'll see that the categories are here. So fruits and vegetables that are on the left hand side of the page take up half of your plate. This has to be part of every healthy meal. Um, grains take about a little more than a fourth of your plate, ideally from whole grains. Protein takes up about a fourth of the plate. And then there's a dairy section over here. Um, we're not going to dive deep into why it's sectioned out this way, but I did, I did section out the, the presentation to talk about dairy, grains, protein, fat, vegetables, and fruit. Um, so if you guys have questions about this particular my plate, happy to talk about that at the end. 
Um, so let's start with dairy. Um, okay, let's break dairy down as a food group. And what is the issue with dairy? What are the common um, misconceptions about dairy? What are the uh, the discussions going on about dairy? Is it healthy? Is it not? What's good? What should I choose? Let's talk about that. Let me let this person in. Okay. Um, for those of you who are just now joining, please uh, open up the chat button and it I typed out in English and Spanish uh, how to choose your language. Otherwise, you will not be able to hear this presentation. So just tune into the chat and you'll you'll know how to do that. So what's the problem with traditional dairy? What is this all of the myth and the discussion going on around dairy right now? One of the biggest points I want to call out, and all of us here, most of us here are parents, most people believe and think that milk is part of a is needed for our growing children. That is not true. Dairy is not necessarily needed after the age of two. And the reason is because of the changing dynamic of um, our livestock and of the process of, of the dairy that we're drinking now. And I'm saying that is not that dairy is an unhealthy food. It's just a changed food. And there's a lot of other ways to get what dairy offers in a way that our bodies better respond. So hopefully this is, this is uh, not a bunch of jargon at this moment. Um, the consumption of cow's milk is not recommended for infants at all. Human milk Breast milk is, is suggested for infants up until age one. And then if you wanted to introduce cow's milk from age one to two, that's okay, but it's not recommend, it's not necessarily required and certainly not required for uh, children after age two, unless they are responding well to it digestively. Um, again, we can talk more about this in a minute. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommend that infants below age one are never given cow's milk at all. Milk and dairy is also, and we're going to get to this in the fat section, but milk and dairy is also the top source of saturated fat in the U in, all around the world, but in the U.S. Saturated fat, we'll, we'll get into this more in a second, is technically called the unhealthy fat, the type of fat that contributes to heart disease, high cholesterol high blood pressure, right? Um, this contributes to a variety of chronic issues, not just heart disease, but type two diabetes, breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease, you name it. Um, lactose intolerance is one of the most common causes of gut issues. Nearly 50 million American adults are lactose intolerant. Whether you want to admit it or not, half of us are. 95% of Asians are, 60 to 80% of African Americans are, and Ashwakazi uh, Jews, 80 to 100% of American Indians are lactose intolerant, and 50 to 80% of Hispanics are also uh, lactose intolerant. This is because of the changing food supply, the way that we're bringing up our livestock with um, antibiotics, with uh, a lot of growth hormone, with all sorts of other additives and, cha and we're, we've changed the system. The milk that you're drinking now is not the same as the milk that your grandparents drank. Okay. That is why we're seeing so many people intolerant to dairy now than we used to. Um, and why is this a problem? And this is a, this is a, why is gut issues a problem? Chronic gut issues. If you continually have gut issues because of lactose intolerance, for instance, this leads to malabsorption of other nutrients. If our gut, our gut is what absorbs vitamins, minerals, fat, protein, all the things we need for a healthy body. If our guts are not functioning properly, we are not absorbing the nutrients. Even if we're eating the nutrients, it's a lot harder for our body to absorb it, right? This contributes, contributes to things like diarrhea, constipation, but also anxiety, depression, headaches, chronic illness down the line, right? And a lot of discomfort in the meantime. So this is, this is why dairy is uh, getting a lot of backlash right now in media and why you might have, you might be hearing a lot about it. Uh, and like I mentioned, the current production of milk contains many contaminants more than they used to, um, including hormones that are given to the cow, antibiotics, pesticides, all of this. And these can lead to a variety of chronic issues. 
I do want to pause right here because I like to give the balance of the scale. Milk can be a very healthy food. It's not necessarily a healthy food for everybody. It is really important to choose um, better sources of milk when you're choosing milk, um, whole, you know, uh, from knowing the supplier and the production that you're, you're buying from is really important. And also listening to your body, listening to your children's body. If they're having responses to milk, it could be worse for their body than the benefits of having milk is. So what does this mean for us? This is just the breakdown. This is the myth that we're hearing, or not the myth. This is the, the situation analysis that we're in. Okay, so let's say your child or you are having digestive issues, cramps, diarrhea, constipation, you know, mood issues because you've realized that you're actually lactose intolerant. You're very nervous as a parent because you're like, wow, if I can't give my kid milk, where the heck are they going to get calcium and vitamin D from those, those two main um, vitamins and minerals that are required for a uh, healthy bones, right? Give me one second here. Hello, hello, hello. If you are just now joining the presentation, please uh, check out the chat. Um, it will explain to you how to choose your language, because if you don't choose your language, you won't be able to hear the presentation, but we've typed it in the chat. There we go. Hello, hello, hello. Please uh, check out the chat really quickly to uh, uh, learn how to choose your language because you need to go to the icon at the bottom to choose your language in order to hear the presentation. Okay. If you have questions, just raise your hand and I will, I will help you. Um, okay, so where, where can kids and you get calcium and also vitamin D that without getting milk, without drinking milk? Lots and lots and lots of places. So I've given you a little bit of a breakdown here. So one cup of regular one to 2% milk will give you about 276 milligrams of calcium. That's about 28% of your daily intake that you need. All right, one more announcement here. Sorry guys, for those of you listening, um, if you're just now joining, please check out the chat. Um, it will explain to you how to choose your language. If you do not choose a language, you will not be able to hear this presentation. So check out the chat, choose your language, and we're gonna keep going. Okay, so one cup of milk gives you about 28% of your daily recommended intake of calcium. Where can you get calcium from other sources if you do decide and choose that you're either dairy intolerant or, you're, or you want to veer away from dairy based on the discussion we just had? Sesame seeds are one of the biggest sources. Sesame seeds, um, things like tahini, if you've ever used tahini in um, salad dressings or in a smoothie, um, it looks a lot like peanut butter, but it's actually made from sesame seeds, or you can just use sesame seeds in your meals, in a stir fry, this and that. Um, sesame seeds are one of the best sources of calcium, even more so than milk. Um, chia seeds as well, a huge source of calcium, way more than milk per uh, serving size. Um, winged beans, general, the, the green bean category has a lot of calcium in it. You can see the 44% daily intake for a serving. Almonds are a wonderful source of calcium as well, 37% per serving as compared to one cup of milk. Um, tofu is a very surprising source of uh, calcium, giving you more than uh, a milk would for a serving size. Turnip greens, wonderful source of calcium, bok choy, figs, herring is a wonderful source of, of calcium. Also, I wanna call out that if you are buying canned um, fish, canned tuna, canned salmon, sardines, and things like that to keep uh, shelf stable in your, in your um, pantry. Buying fish with bones in it will give you a huge source of calcium. Obviously, when it's canned, it ends up uh, disintegrating so you can actually eat it. It's not like crunching on bones, obviously. Um, but just check out the cans of, of fish with bones included. That's going to give you a huge source of calcium for your fish that you have at home. Um, broccoli is a huge source of calcium. Um, also fortified orange juice and just regular orange juice, but I would always recommend getting fortified orange juice because it will also have vitamin D in it. Um, and then also over here on the left-hand side, these are some other sources of really wonderful um, 
uh, calcium. If you do tolerate certain cheeses, cheeses obviously are a good um, source. Um, some grains are a wonderful source of calcium. So the concept here is cal milk is not the only place to get calcium. Lots of other places to get calcium. And one of the biggest themes of all of my discussions is the more variety of food that you have in your diet every day, so not eating the same things every day, changing it up and trying some new things is going to give you a well a wealth of nutrients that you need. Um, and it's not just milk that has these nutrients in it. Um, so what, what's included in the dairy group and what could we do, what could we swap it with if we wanted to? So what's in the dairy group, most of you already know, cheese, yogurt, butter, animal milk of any sort, cow, goat, sheep, etc. cream, sour creams, mil uh, milk creamers, coffee creamers, uh, as well as ice cream. Most ice creams are also um, dairy. So what's the this or that for dairy? Instead of cow's milk, maybe try, and this is at the grocery store, try cashew milk, soy milk, coconut milk, oat milk, rice milk, pea milk, hemp milk, macadamia or nut, hazelnut milk. All of these are from nuts or seeds. For your children though, if you are worried about um, having the, uh, the a comparable nutritional profile to cow's milk for the growth and development of your kid, the best two are soy and pea. Those are gonna give you the best sources of fat and the best sources of protein along with the vitamins and minerals that uh, cow's milk have as well. But for you as an, ad an adult, try oops, try any of these other um, nut or seed milks uh, instead of cow's milk. Also want to point out, I didn't write it here, but I should have, please be on the lookout and we're going to get to this in the sugar section. Please be on the lookout for unsweetened alternative milks and alternative dairy products, because one of the things that's happening now that so many people are shifting away from dairy is that they're filling dairy with lots of added sugar. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. Just always read the food label, choose the unsweetened kind. That's gonna be hugely important to maintaining your health while you, if, you, if you're deciding to switch off of dairy. Instead of butter, straight butter, you can try ghee. Ghee is unfiltered butter. It is still a form of butter, but it does not have the same lactose or casein in it that regular uh, butter does. And it has a lot of other nutrients as well. It tastes almost identical to, to, to butter. So if you want an, an easy switch, you can try ghee. If you want to get off dairy altogether, you can try coconut oil, olive oil, avocado, bananas, or even dairy-free margarine. Most recipes that you can call that you are baking at home can have can use any of these as a substitute for butter. So check that out. Instead of creamer, milk creamers, if you're a, if you're a coffee creamer type of person, I've actually lifted listed some of my favorite dairy free brands here. Califia Farms has an almond milk creamer. Silk Soy Creamer ha is wonderful. Coffee Mate has a dairy free creamer. Um, if you want to maybe screenshot this particular brand section, these are all found at either Trader Joe's, Sprouts, Whole Foods, if you shop there, um, and even Ralph's and Vons have some of these brands as well. Um, again, these brands too have uh, unsweetened versus sweetened. So please just always look for the unsweetened version. Don't get tricked into thinking you're getting a healthier option by getting a non-dairy uh, version and then having it filled with a bunch of sugar. So just look for that unsweetened label. Um, instead of ice cream, this is one of the best. Over the last five years, there has been so many brands of non-dairy ice creams that are so good, you guys. I have tested, I've approved them. They're wonderful. Um, the ones that I've listed here are my favorite brands. Um, not all of them, obviously ice cream is going to have a lot of sugar. So, so proceed with caution, but if you are looking for some really delicious non-dairy ice creams, these brands are my favorite. Uh, and we can come back to these slides if you guys want to take, take, um, take any notes. So the bottom line, milk and dairy products are not necessary in the diet and, and can be harmful to health. 
And it's certainly not needed over the age of two. It is something that we, I'm trying to educate parents. There's lots of other ways that you can get calcium from things that are not dairy. Um, and again, those gut issues that a lot of people with lactose intolerant experience can actually be more harmful than the benefits of having dairy. So again, if you want me to come back to that at any point, I'm happy to. Um, the best thing to do is consume, consume a healthful diet with a variety of foods, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, peas, lentils. That's going to give you a whole well-rounded version of nutrients than just having cow's milk. Um, you can also replace cow's milk with other sorts of nut and seed milks or pea milks. Um, these nutrient dense foods will help you meet your nutri nutrition requirements with ease and without the health risk, health risk associated with dairy products. Okay. I told you I was going to move quickly, so I'm going to keep going. Um, let's break down the grain group. Okay. So what's the situation with grains? What are people, what's the discussion and the myths at the top, the discussions around grain? Well, first of all, for those of you who are nervous about carbohydrates and grains, I want to call out that, okay, one second. For those of you who are just now joining the, today's presentation, please check out the chat and uh, learn how to choose your language because if you do not choose your language, you will not hear this presentation. So check out the chat, it's in both English and Spanish. Um, so first and foremost, we are in an age right now where lots of people are demonizing grains. Um, I have a huge problem with that because whole grains are part of a healthy diet and are a, are a big source of many vitamins and minerals that we need every day. However, one of the biggest things that I'm going to talk about right now is that variety is key. Why do I talk about that? Um, because corn and wheat are the two main sources of grain that we're getting, but there are a plethora of other grains that are just, are, are sometimes even healthier than the wheats and corn. And we're going to talk about that in a second. The grain group, if you go back to that slide, um, okay, here we go. One more time. One second, you guys, sorry. If you are just now joining today's presentation, please check out the chat. It will explain to you how to choose your language. Otherwise you will not be able to hear today's presentation. Um, if you go back to that slide at the very beginning, the my plate slide, you will notice that grains take up almost over a fourth of your plate. They should every meal. Grains make up nearly half of the human diet in general. When we are able to, when back in the day when we were learning how to farm as humans, um, we actually started learning how to manipulate the crops so that we could um, start farming other than otherwise we were, we were traveling with the seasons, right? Okay. One second here. Hey, Amber, if you're on, do you mind helping me to admit people? Yeah. Um, I was actually going to, um, let you know that when you sign up, if you sign on a little bit late, if you look in the chat, it doesn't show your message on there. So you might have to just keep re-putting okay. the instructions on how okay. to pick a language. Got it, got it, cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, um, back in the day, uh, we used to migrate with the seasons, with the animals. We were never settled. We were nomadic. We were constantly moving. Eventually though, once fire was part of our, our world and we could actually settle in one place, that's when farming began, right? That's when we started manipulating plants and growing and seeding the earth ourselves so that we could actually uh, plan for food. When that began, when we were able to actually settle in one place, there were only a handful of grains that we decided to uh, focus on. Wheat and corn were the main two. Wheat and corn were not the only grains that our ancestors and our um, the ancient humans used to eat. We used to travel and eat hundreds of different grains. But when we started settling, when we started getting comfortable in one spot, we started manipulating two main crops, wheat and corn. And as a result, wheat and corn have become incredibly manipulated over time because we've had to grow at scale. We've had to create huge amounts of grain for the global population. Um, 
wheat and corn are incredible grains. Even still today, they're feeding and, and keeping so many of us alive. However, they're incredibly processed. They're not the same as they once were when we first started farming uh, uh, corn and grain. And for the processes of this particular conversation, I'm going to focus on wheat um, because gluten sensitivities have become a huge problem over the last decade. Gluten is the protein binder found in wheat. All wheat products will have gluten. Gluten is highly inflammatory, even for people without celiac disease. Celiac disease is the main um, gluten issue. So if you're intolerant to gluten, um, or if you have an allergy to gluten, you will have a, a condition called celiac disease. It's, it's hugely problematic for the gut. Um, and you truly can't have even a cross-contaminated food that has been touched by gluten or anything like that. Most people, there's only 1% of the population that actually has full-blown celiac disease, but many, many people in the States and in the world right now are gluten intolerant or gluten sensitive. And we're going to talk about what that means. Um, and just to give you an example, just a quick side note, um, gluten, the bread that our grandparents used to eat in the fifties had about maybe 10% gluten in it. The bread that we're eating today has over 45% gluten in it. That's because wheat has changed or the process that we have made with food has changed. So we're getting a whole heck of a lot more gluten today than we used to. Our body is having a hard time catching up. So if you have symptoms like bloating, gas, diarrhea, eczema, acne, hormone issues, and you're like, what the heck is this about? You might be gluten sensitive. You might be gluten intolerant. And that's just the, the way of the world right now. Um, also, uh, as part of this category, I will briefly talk about sugar, although we're going to spend most of the next presentation in November talking about sugar. So, um, but just as a quick side note, um, we're also eating a lot more added sugar than we ever have before. Um, added sugar, sugar is part of the grain and carbohydrate category because sugar comes out, outside of sugar cane high fructose corn syrup, rice syrup, all of these different types of sugar, added sugars that we create and add back into food. This is called added sugar. Um, this is one of the major contributors of obesity, type two diabetes and heart disease in the U S and a lot of our grains and bread products have added sugar added to it. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. So this is the situation of grains. And this is also, by the way, one of the reasons why so many people feel better when they go onto a keto diet, which is a diet that is uh, very, very limited of grains where you don't have as many a day. But I'm trying to explain to you that gluten, removing gluten is actually a good thing for a while to help your body adjust, but not, not removing all grains because there's lots of other grains. And we'll talk about this in a minute that are super healthy, that give you so many vitamins and minerals that are not going to inflame you the same way as gluten does. So um, let's just go through this really quickly. I kind of touched on a lot of these things. Wheat and gluten, what's the issue? The wheat grain has been significantly altered. Let me see here. The grain uh, seed has been significantly altered to provide crops, um, to help them become more resistant to drought, to make them more resilient during these processes, and also to help it bake more easily and quickly, right? So we're all about quick, fast production of food, right? Unfortunately, over the past even 50 years, but over the past century, really 100 years, our stomachs haven't adapted to how quickly we've changed and modified this product. And we, and also we are eating way more wheat today than we ever have before. Um, so most of us aren't supporting uh, our gut also the way that we should. There's a huge lack of vegetables in our diet. There's a huge increase of antibiotic use, which really wipes out our gut. So when we also, when we do these things, when we don't have enough vegetables and we're taking lots of antibiotics and we're not eating a healthy diet and also eating lots of gluten, 
This incredibly uh, inflames and damages our gut. And what happens again when our gut is damaged? We have malabsorption of nutrients, of other nutrients. Our bodies aren't able to absorb those as well, right? It leads to other obesity issues, chronic, chronic disease issues, all sorts of problems. Um, genetics do play a role. If you are, if you have a history, a, a family history of celiac disease, for instance, you're probably going to have more likelihood of having that particular disease. However, more and more people are becoming gluten intolerant, whether or not there's a genetic history in your family. Um, gluten intolerance, by the way, the only difference between celiac disease and gluten intolerance is the antibodies that our body produces, but the symptoms are the same. So if you have gluten intolerance, you're going to have the same symptoms as a celiac patient, meaning you're going to have GI issues, bloating, gas, constipation, headaches, brain fog, joint pain, sometimes numbness in the limbs, anxiety, depression. All of these things that can happen when you have celiac can also happen if you have gluten intolerance. You're just not creating the antibodies that celiac patients are. And you're not having, um, and we're not going to talk about this in depth today, but you're not going to have that blunting of our gut microflora as celiac patients do. You're, you, you, you're more resilient, I will say, than celiac patients are, but the symptoms are the same. Um, and this can happen within hours or days after having gluten. So if you're thinking, oh, well, I didn't have gluten today, but I'm still having issues, your body takes up to 72 hours sometimes, so up to three days to respond to a food. This is hugely unhelpful if we're trying to have a quick uh, response to things, but this is something I deal with a lot when I'm treating patients is um, sometimes it can take up to 72 hours to feel a result of a food that you've, you've ingested. So um, don't get confused by that. Um, what foods have gluten? Um, we're just gonna talk about this really quickly. Obviously anything with wheat in it, conventional breads have wheat. Pizza, the dough has wheat, pastas that are made from wheat, certain cereals, the list at the bottom are, are just a hefty bunch, cakes, cookies, baked goods, certain beverages, and also certain sauces like soy sauce, beer, anything with malt flavoring. Wheat is in so much of our food supply, which is why we're eating so much more of it today than we ever used to. Okay. This or that, navigating gluten. What can you do if you're trying to, trying to um, moderate your gluten intake? Instead of bread at a meal, instead of sandwich, maybe try a side of rice, a side of potatoes, a side of corn even, chickpeas, or another starchy vegetable like yuca, cassava root, or beans. All of these have wonderful sources of vitamins and minerals from that grain category that are not going to be bread. Also at the very bottom of this slide, I've add, added two of my favorite gluten-free bread options, brand options. The same thing applies um, that I mentioned about the dairy section applies to the gluten section. Anything that is changed like uh, dairy alternatives or gluten alternatives, beware of the added sugar. These two brands down here are mostly free of added sugar. I love these brands because they're pretty all encompassing, very, very healthy choices. Don't be fooled that just if you're going gluten-free, if you're getting a gluten-free granola or gluten-free bread, be good at reading a nutrition facts label because there's, they, sometimes they substitute a lot of sugar um, to make, to try to modify the taste. Don't get tricked into that. Uh, okay, instead of cereal for breakfast, try buckwheat porridge. Buckwheat is one of my favorite grains. I have some wonderful recipes I can share with you guys if you wanna try buckwheat porridge. Millet is another thing that makes a wonderful like oatmeal type thing in the morning that is a wonderful, that you make almost the exact same way or just opt for oats. Oats are a really wonderful source of, of um, and one of the easiest ones because most people know know how to make that. Instead of pizza crust, you can certainly try cauliflower crust or gluten-free crust that you find at Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is one of the best brands for gluten-free um, pizza crust alternatives um, and also cauliflower and, and um, other, there's a lot of other things besides cauliflower, by the way. Um, just go to your, go to the uh, frozen food section of 
Ralph's or Vons or Trader Joe's or wherever you're shopping, and they will likely have a gluten-free alternative for some of these, some of these things. Instead of flour tortillas, which are made from wheat, opt for corn. If you can make them at home, even better. Instead of soy sauce, which is a wheat-based sauce, there is a sauce called tamari sauce. It tastes the exact same way, but it is gluten-free. Also, if you wanna try sauces, but you're trying to avoid gluten, mustards, vinegars, olive oils, making your sauces at home with those types of things are going to be the better, better play, better option here. Okay, quickly moving on to sugar. I'm not gonna spend as much time on sugar because we're gonna be spending all of next section on it, but sugar is part of the carbohydrate group along with grains. Um, cane sugar comes from the cane sugar plant, but other sugars, like I mentioned, like high fructose corn syrup, rice syrup come from grains, breaking completely breaking down the corn and rice grain into a sugar. Um, these added sugars, these sugars that we create are one of the biggest, strongest contributors to chronic disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes, and more. They are very high in calories and have virtually zero nutritional value. Um, this is why reading nutritional facts labels, which I'll show you one in a second for added sugar is so important. Um, natural sugars though, don't be confused. Natural sugars like those found in fruit and grain, whole grains are known to have a beneficial effect on the body and actually contribute to our antioxidant profile and our fiber content. This is really good. So please don't confuse fruit with added uh -huh. sugar. Okay. If you just came on, please mute yourself. All right, there we go. Um, also, like I mentioned, just to, to seal the deal on this one, added sugar, added sugar, not total sugars on a nutrition facts label, but added sugar is the number one reason we have an obesity epidemic right now and is single-handedly leading to uh, the rise in chronic disease that we're experiencing right now in our, um, in our country specifically. And we'll talk a lot more about that next, next uh, presentation, but we'll go quickly into this right now. So what is added sugar? Added sugar is anything not naturally found in a particular food. So fruit is not considered an added sugar. Those are natural forms of sugar. Those are good forms of sugar. Anything that you add yourself, like honey to your coffee, sugar to your cereal, any sweeteners you add to any cooking that you're doing at home, that's considered an added sugar, okay? This can be done at home, like I said, when you're making food, or it can be done during processing of food. So cereals are a huge source of added sugar. Juices, sodas, breads, granola bars, sauces, anything that comes in a package is very likely a suspect for added sugar. Milk alternatives, by the way, all those almond milks, cashew milks, things, that's why I mentioned get the unsweetened kind because that is a other huge source of added sugar if you're not careful. If you look up here at the top right, this is a nutrition facts label that you will see on the back of all of your food. Under the total carbohydrate category, you not only have fiber, but you have total sugars. So that's anything in that food. So a fruit would have probably a total of 24 grams of total sugar, but zero added sugars. This particular food has 12 grams of total sugars and 10 of those 10 grams have been added after the fact. This is a problem. This is a really big problem. So this is the section right here that you want to look at, not the total sugar, the added sugar. Okay. This is the, this is what we're, what we're talking about right now. The American heart association recommends that adult women and children, uh, over two should have no more than six teaspoons. So that's 24 grams of added sugar a day for men that that's up to 26 grams. But if you look here, 10, 10 grams of added sugar, this is almost half. So this, maybe this is, I bet this is a one cup of of Cheerios, for instance, let's just say that this is what this nutrition facts label is. One cup of Cheerios almost is half of your added sugar allotment for the day. So if you go have a Coke or if you have a cookie or if you have something else, you're already over that added sugar allotment for your day that's recommended, okay? 
So read nutrition facts labels. We'll do another presentation on that um, another time. Children under two should be having zero added sugars a day. Zero. <laughs> recommended from American Heart Association. That's very, very hard in today's food, food, food world. So don't feel bad if this is, this is you, this is everybody, but it is something to note um, for our health and something that we should always be aware of. So reading nutrition facts labels is super important. The top sources of added sugar that we're getting today, sugar sweetened beverages, that includes things like sodas, juices, alternative milks, if they're not unsweetened, creamers, things like this, dessert, any dessert really, um, sweet snacks, cookies, brownies, cakes, pies, granola bars. I didn't add those in here. Ice cream, donuts, pastries. All of these are sources of added sugar. Anything processed, processed, anything in a package that's been changed from its original, um, from its original source will, is considered a processed food. So this or that for sugar, <clears throat> again, instead of cereal, try oatmeal with fruit, great source of fiber, great source of uh, natural sugars. You can try a whole grain bread with nut butter for breakfast. Um, you can try eggs and avocado and vegetables for breakfast. You can do a breakfast smoothie. You can do uh, unsweetened yogurt, granola, and fruit. Beautiful sources of, of um, nutrients and fiber in the morning for you and your kid. Instead of creamers, opt for unsweetened creamers and milks. I'm gonna, I really wanna drive that home today. Instead of soda, obviously water is, a huge, is the source of um, fluid that we should be drinking. But if you're not really a huge fan or your kid's not a huge fan of water, try um, flavoring water with fruit. Doing like a spa water with oranges and, and um, you know, strawberries and muddle those in your water. You can do herbal teas. Unsweetened sparkling water is totally okay. You can also add lemon and lime to your water or do fresh pressed juice that you do at home or juices from the store that don't have added sugar in them, okay? And for our kids, when you're doing fresh pressed juice, I always recommend doing half water, half juice, okay? And instead of sh straight sugar, like that white table sugar that you see, I always suggest trying honey. Honey has a lot more nutrients in it than just sugar. Obviously honey is still sugar, but it's a little bit more nutritionally um, sound than regular table sugar. Maple syrup is the same way. Use it in, um, in, uh, in use it conservatively, but obviously a little bit better than just regular uh, table sugar. If you have diabetes or if you're looking for sugar alternatives that are still really wonderful and you can use it one for one in any baking, monk fruit, zero calories, wonderful source of sweetener for those um, diabetics or those watching their sugar intake. And stevia is also um, in moderation, a fairly uh, good source of non-caloric uh, sugar alternatives that you can try. I did that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so the top takeaways for the grain and sugar section, reading nutrition facts label for added sugar, hugely important. Choosing a variety of forms of grain rather than always choosing wheat and corn. Amaranth, millet, buckwheat, uh, quinoa, all of these other rice, even wild rice, all of these other grains are wonderful sources of nutrients and are not going to be as processed as wheat or corn. Opt for natural sweeteners like fruit and even honey in moderation. Water is always a better, cho better choice than juice or, and sodas, but there's obviously ways to spice up your water if you want to have a little bit more fun, like we talked about. And choosing whole grain whenever possible. So reading nutrition facts labels again, making sure your grains are whole grain is gonna be a huge, huge important uh, step. Moving on to protein. Um, protein is a, is the most abundant macronutrient in our bodies. We need it for literally everything that our body uses, our muscles, our bones, our skin, our hair, every body part and tissue uses protein period. It's very important. Adequate protein intake is needed for proper recovery from injury, surgeries, broken bones, also after exercise. It helps to build lean body mass. 
It helps to also keep us full for a longer period of time. It curbs that hunger. And it also helps us to maintain our weight. The caveat to protein that a lot of people are, are I'm seeing a lot of people do today, Americans specifically are eating way too much protein. Um, and when you get past that adequate intake and get into excess intake, Excess protein can accelerate the aging process and contribute to heart disease. Okay. So really important to get enough protein, but not too much. Okay. I know that's super frustrating when you hear that, but, um, balance moderation is key. Um, we see most of this ex excess coming from people who are eating, um, extreme amounts of animal consumption. This is also one of the leading causes of global climate issues, by the way, because um, we're, we're, we're creating mass amounts of land just to house our cows and livestock instead of growing plants. Cows excrete a lot of emissions and greenhouse gases out into the environment that are contributing to, uh, to the um, global climate issues that we're experiencing. So that is why people are turning to vegan and vegetarian options more often to, to be environmentally friendly. That is why. Um, and yes, there's lots of vegan and vegetarian options available, which can be really great. However, quick caveat, just going vegan and vegetarian and swapping all of your, all of your meat products for vegan and vegetarian versions of those products is not a good thing because a lot of those beyond burgers and those types of things are filled with other additives that are just as bad for you over the long run. So we're going to talk about what to eat instead. Um, proteins marketed towards children have some of the worst additives for our health, hot dogs, hams, chicken nuggets, sausages, please be careful with this. Um, try to get the whole versions of these foods instead of just getting the convenient versions of these foods at the grocery store, you're always going to be better off. Um, so let's quickly go into this. Um, what foods contain protein? All animal products and animal derivatives. So eggs is an animal derivative. Chicken, beef, pork, duck, bison, bacon, cheese, milk, all of these are great sources of protein. There are also tons of plant-based sources of protein that are just as wonderful. Quinoa, seeds, nuts, nut butter, broccoli, lentils, avocados, tofu, whole grain breads are wonderful sources of plant-based um, proteins. Also, there's we're getting a lot of proteins from processed proteins like hot dogs, hamburgers, sausages, corned beef, 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 jerky. Again, just to call us out, processed meat is that anything that's been transformed through salting, curing, fermentation, smoking, or other processes to enhance the flavor or improve preservation of a product. So instead of going and getting hot dogs, actually getting the actual meat and making it home is going to be a much better version of that. Okay. And we're going to talk about that right now. This or that for protein. Instead of store-bought hot dogs, hamburgers, and chicken nuggets, try making a turkey meat sauce or a lean chicken patties at home. There's lots of really easy recipes to do that at home instead of getting the convenient versions of those at the store. And also those are cheaper to get the actual meat versus the one that's already pre-packaged, pre-prepared. Instead of sugar-sweetened yogurt, try unsweetened yogurt or Greek yogurt with honey and fruit. Again, milk and milk products are, can be a wonderful source of protein. If you don't, if you're not intolerant to milk and your kids are not showing intolerance to milk, try Greek yogurt unsweetened with some, with some honey and granola. That's a huge source of protein right there. Instead of beef, um, which is beef can be good in moderation. I'm not saying to avoid beef, beef altogether, but if you're having heart issues, if you're trying to reduce your beef intake, try to swap it for some fish. Even canned tuna, as long as the canned tuna is canned in water, huge source of protein, super easy, super convenient, and, and mostly fairly healthy. And again, if you're trying to go vegan or vegetarian, yes, Beyond Burgers here and there for a, for a cookout or whatever for a holiday, that's okay. Having them every day or every week, I wouldn't recommend. I would recommend trying beans, legumes, lentils, tofu, peas, nuts and seeds instead. There's lots of ways to make um, lentil burgers, legume burgers at home. I have lots of recipes for that. If you guys are interested, just let me know. Top takeaways for protein. The more natural the source, the better. 
Avoid processed meats as much as possible, including the vegan and vegetarian options, unless it's only once in a while. Again, once in a while is okay, but don't swap them every day. You do not need meat at every meal or even every day. Try doing vegan or vegetarian Mondays with lots of lentils and beans. Choose plant-based sources of protein whenever possible. Peas, by the way, peas are a massive source of protein. If your kid is struggling with meat, add peas to their pasta, add peas to their rice. They're going to get a huge bang for their, uh, with protein there. Eat more nuts and seeds, huge sources of protein there too. Um, we're running a little bit over, um, but I'm going to try to jump through. We have two sections left, um, and these should be go, should go pretty quickly. Um, the fruit and vegetable breakdown. What, what's the situation with fruits and vegetables? Um, first and foremost, we are not getting enough of these at all. Most of us are not getting enough fruits and vegetables. Half of every plate should have a combination of fruits and vegetables in it. Children and adults should be getting at least five portions of, of a variety of fruits and vegetables every day, ideally more like nine to 12. I know that's probably going to blow your mind, but it's true. In order to differentiate you versus your kid, the serving size should be about the palm of your hand. So that's how you can tell the difference. The lack of fruits and vegetable intake in our diets is, is contributing to poor gut health, like constipation, diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, anxiety, depression, and other chronic issues. So we need to feed our gut properly with fruits and vegetables. They get the microbiome, the microbiota, the bacteria in our gut, they eat the fiber that is found on fruits and vegetables. So we need to feed them well, okay? Also, eating the rainbow is important. A lot of us are just going for the same fruits and vegetables all the time, but variety is key. Uh, we need to eat all of the colors, the purples, the oranges, the greens, the, the blues. This is gonna enhance our immune system, our antioxidant consumption, as well as our fiber intake, which helps us to be healthier and energetic throughout our lives. Yes, quantity matters, but variety matters just as much. So please mix it up, eat the rainbow. The biggest situation with fruits and vegetables is, should I buy organic or, or inorganic? First and foremost, pesticides and other chemicals can be more harmful for our health than the benefits of eating the certain fruits and vegetables that were grown in them. So please screenshot this page. There is that such thing called the dirty dozen and the clean 15. The dirty dozen should never be bought inorganic. These should always be organic because they do not have the rinds or the peels that protect them from the pesticides. Avocados have a rind that you remove. So they're, you're not getting those pesticides from the avocados, which makes it a safer version to buy inorganic. Strawberry should always be bore, always be purchased organic. Spinach, organic. You can't peel anything from a spinach, right? So this is the most important thing about the fruits and vegetables is the dirty dozen. These need to always be organic, period. You don't want to inadvertently be adding toxins and pesticides to your body just by trying to increase your, uh, increase your fruit and vegetable intake. If this is a financial issue, focus on the clean 15 and don't buy these or these don't need to be bought organic necessarily. Okay. Again, the, the helpful tip, if there is a peel, it is safer to be eaten in organic without peels are more harmful to eat in organic. So please screenshot this page and adhere to it. Um, this page, I'm not going to really focus on as much because we're short on time. Um, there's a lot of things that people are eating the same things every day. Lots of people are eating the potatoes, carrots, broccoli, lettuce, cucumbers, bananas. Try other things. Instead of potatoes, try sweet potatoes or roasted carrots or summer squash. Instead of raw carrots, try turnips and radishes. Broccoli, swap it for cauliflower every now and again. Instead of butter lettuce, try collard greens or sauteed kale. Try zucchini instead of cucumber, kiwis and cherries instead of bananas, raspberries and blackberries instead of blueberries. Try to switch it up. Variety matters. Eating the rainbow matters. Top takeaway for fruits and veggies, variety is just as important as quantity, including fruits and veggies at every meal, emphasizing vegetables more than fruit. Getting creative and fun to encourage kids to try fruits and vegetables. I love sauces and dips for that. Kids do too. 
Um, and please adhere to the dirty dozen clean 15 list when you're shopping to avoid unnecessary toxin overload to your body with those pesticides, okay? Relabels. Last section here, again, apologies for running so quickly, but um, last, last section. What's the fat situation that we're dealing with? First and foremost, fat is not going to make you fat <laughs> unless you're choosing the wrong kinds of fat. Fat is a huge, important macronutrient. It gives our body long lasting energy and, and is essential for our survival. It not only um, is fat needed, but fat is needed to store our fat soluble vitamins, including A, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. If we don't have enough fat, we're not storing these vitamins, okay? Fat is needed to protect our bodies from the damage uh, from chronic inflammation, which we're getting all sorts of chronic inflammation all over the place. Fat's needed to help with that. It's needed in proper amounts for proper growth and development of our kids, especially with their brains. Um, okay, the situation though, is that there's two specific types of fat. There's saturated fat that we briefly talked about at the beginning of um, the presentation with dairy. That's the considered bad fat. That's saturated fat is what's contributed to our heart disease epidemic, our obesity epidemic. Unsaturated fat though is good. It's really, really beneficial for our body. That's what we should be focusing on. Unfortunately, Americans specifically are eating an excess of saturated fat and not enough unsaturated fats. And again, this is contributing to obesity and the rising heart disease epidemic. So the best ways to differentiate between saturated fat and unsaturated, unsaturated fats, so bad, good, is that saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Think butter, red meat, dairy products, cheese, processed foods. These are all solid at room temperature. When that solidifies at room temperature, it's also going to solidify in our arteries, making it more likely to clog our arteries in large quantities. Unsaturated fats will be liquid at room temperature. Think olive oil, avocado oil, even nuts and seeds when you press them are going to be liquid. These types of fats lower cholesterol and inflammation and improve aging and wellness over time. So we're not trying to avoid fat, we're trying to choose the right types of fat. So oil versus a McDonald's burger here, right? This or that for fat. Instead of butter, again, try olive oil if you're using it for low heat or avocado oil if you're using it for high heat, okay? You can even swap for coconut oil here or there or ghee in moderation. These bottom two are technically saturated, but they're healthier versions of such saturated fat. I'm not gonna go into that in detail right now, but use these two in moderation, but they can be used every now and again. Instead of dairy, opt for unsweetened dairy alternatives. Instead of red, red meat, opt for fish, chicken, or lentils. Instead of hydrogenated vegetable oils, which include canola, palm, or peanut, try avocado, olive oil, or coconut oil instead. Instead of fried fish or fried chicken, try grilled and broiled versions of those things. Instead of store-bought chips, you can, even though those can be fine in moderation here and there, but try baking your potatoes at home. I love making uh, baked potato chips, sweet potato chips at home. The really, really easy ways to still have delicious food without that added fat, uh, saturated fat. All right, top takeaways for fat, choose whole meats instead of processed meats whenever possible. Remember those, those animal um, meats have lots of saturated fat in them. Ditch hydrogenated veggie oils altogether. They're terrible for our bodies. Try new ways of using oil instead of using butter. And again, if you're a baker or cook a lot at home, there are so many recipes out there that use these healthier oils versus butter. Look for those recipes. They're just as great. When in doubt, cooking at home is always a better choice. Exercise and movement, which we didn't talk a lot about, about it a lot today, but exercise and movement is very helpful for mitigating the harmful effects of a high fat diet, specifically for improving our heart health, which we talk about ad nauseum um, in these presentations, and we can talk about those more later on. Oh my gosh, you guys, we did it. Do you have any questions or thoughts about what we just talked about? Woo, that was a big one.
If you guys have any questions or thoughts about recipes, or if you want me to go back to or share these slides with you, I'm happy to. Um, we did record this presentation in English, which I will post and send around to everybody for you to have. Um, so please note that you can go back and listen to this again. Um, this is a very big topic. And we break these down um, all the time in, in subsequent presentations. So please keep coming to these because it will contribute to your overall understanding of these, um, this information. Uh, what do you think about eating pork? Um, pork is great. Again, pork, pork is, is kind of in between red meat and chicken. Um, it does not have as much saturated fat as red meat. It is a good source of protein. It is fairly healthy in general. I would always recommend limiting animal proteins to a couple times a week at maximum. But yes, I would say pork is a great thing to have. Pork chops, even lamb chops, they're not, that's not pork, but lamb chops too can be eaten, eaten, can be eaten. In, moderate, in moderation. Any other thoughts? Um, also with the meat category, just to, just to call this out really quickly, um, really important to choose uh, grass-fed, grass-finished versions of meats. Um, so um, I forget what they're called. Tyson Farms, it has like a monopoly over most of our chickens. Um, they're not a great, they're not a great producer of um animal protein. So if you can look at the labels and look at where your meats are coming from, looking for labels like grass fed, grass finished, that's always going to be better. Um, if that, that doesn't mean that you can't do that on a budget, by the way, there are always sales and things like that that are going on at the grocery store. Please be mindful of those. Um, that's always a better way to buy your meat because they're going to have less uh, antibiotics, less growth hormone, all those things than the conventional versions of those meats. Any other thoughts or questions, you guys? Okay. Yes, I will share the presentation with all of you guys, um, including you, Alex, for sure. Um, yes, 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 yes. If there are no other questions, I will stay on, um, but feel free to, to pop off if you guys want. And please come to our next presentation all about sugar um, on November, I believe November, let's see, 16th. Let me just verify. We're gonna dive deep into the sugar category, which is so important, you guys. But the next presentation is November 16th at 10 a.m. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. And we'll talk to all of you guys soon. Can I give an example of a keto meal? Um, a keto meal would be something that is higher in fat, mostly. So ketogenic, don't confuse that with high protein. Yes, it has higher protein, but it's mostly fat. Um, so a keto meal would be something that has, for instance, a breakfast could be eggs, avocado, vegetables. Um, the, uh, having a whole avocado would be big on keto having some proteins and vegetables would be a keto diet. Keto avoids uh, grains almost altogether, which I don't recommend. Uh, yes, moderating the types of grains that you're eating are important. I don't recommend avoiding grains altogether though, because there's lots of really wonderful nutrients in the grain category. Um, but yes, uh, keto would be mostly um, fat. Oils, nut seeds, avocado, um, also proteins with fat, like eggs, like I said, um, yeah. Good question. Oh. 
All right, you guys. Thank you, thank you. Feel free to pop off.